Okay, um, today I'm here to talk to you about building mobile apps with roads. And these are, unlike the previous session, these are native mobile apps, not mobile web apps. Uh, so Rhodes is an open source framework that allows you to build native mobile apps for all shipping smartphones, iPhone, Windows Mobile, Blackberry, Symbian, and Android, uh, writing the code one time at a very high level. So uh, briefly on the Rumble mission, uh, our mission is to allow you to mobilize applications very rapidly with a great user experience. We want to provide the high-level productivity and portability of web programming, but still provide the device optimization and offline capability of native mobile apps. So I actually like the fact that we followed uh, Brendan Lim's presentation from Intrader because that's, that's how, you know, if you want to write a mobile web app, it's a great way to do it. If you want to write a native mobile app, that's what we're all about, native mobile apps. But we're still letting you do the sort of web programming experience. Uh, something that I typically have to clarify is, okay, well, we're going to let you write your app in mostly HTML, but wait a minute, that's a web app, and we have to say, no, 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 it's all about native mobile apps, which means taking advantage of device capabilities, camera, pin, SMS, GPS, and also allowing you to work with data offline. And of course, it's all open source for rapid adoption by developers. Um, that's one, one reason it is rapid adoption, but the other thing that's been a sort of pleasant surprise is we've actually got a lot of user contributions to our stuff. And uh, I think that's going to become more and more important over time. So background, this is stuff that you guys already know. Smartphone sales are exploding on their five major smartphone operating systems. But the, the difficulty as a developer is what do you target? Because the growth leaders, iPhone and Android, are the installed base laggards. This, this is especially true for enterprise apps, right? So within the enterprise, when the iPhone's a big device, I love my iPhone, but within the enterprise, it tends to have a much smaller footprint. So the other thing is, and with apologies to Brendan, I really like those guys, and we've actually talked to Intridia about it, uh, providing services uh, around roads, and I think they're incredibly well qualified to do that. And we don't do this at Roam Mobile. We're like just totally focused on building our framework. We'll never provide services. We're getting a lot of demand for it. Those of you that are interested in doing that, we actually have a thing that one of our developers has set up called the Roads Developer Network. It's just about providing referrals out to developers like you that would use our platform. Uh, so, uh, so with the emergence of the iPhone App Store, native apps are pretty much one a day. So uh, users want to use apps that run locally on their device, and certainly for things that, uh, in, in enterprise app scenarios, where you're changing data. Uh, so part of my background is I used to manage engineering for the server and our browser at Good Technology. We had the first Ajax taken in the browser, and uh, it was called Good Access. Now I think it's called, I don't even know what they're calling it now, but it was called Good Access. And, and we've got, uh, uh, we had 8,000 companies using it. But here's the thing, when we actually went out to these companies and we wanted to have examples of them interacting, you know, creating transactional data, plenty of them used it to read stuff. We couldn't find one out of 8,000 companies that, there, that they actually had people like changing data by the browser. So uh, that, combined with the fact that at Good we had 200 engineers working on just email and browser on just three OSs, made me realize that there has to be a better way. There needs to be some kind of platform. Uh, because we really we got it, we had a really good product, I think, for those of you that have used it for Windows Mobile and Tom and Symbian, we really never quite got there. And we had people requesting us to do it for other OSs, and we just said, are you kidding? We can't even do free. So uh, that, that was sort of my formative experience of why we started Runable was so that you could have a way that you could write an app once and it runs everywhere. Uh, and also that it really is about native apps. So uh, what, we, what we built uh, is a uh, framework called Rose. It allows you to build the framework quickly 
build the app quickly in HTML and Ruby. And why do I say HTML and Ruby? It's, uh, it's an M model view controller framework, very similar to Rails. We love Rails. We talked about we have this sync server um, that I, I have no written most of the code for. And, and that's all written in Rails. I, I love Rails. Uh, but Rails is between one and two orders of magnitude too big to fit on the device. So what Rose is, uh, it's sort of a bad time on Rose is like Rails, but it goes more places. So, um, so we uh, <laughs> told you it was a bad one. So, um, so it has a lot in common with uh, Rails, but it has, for example, a very lightweight ORM uh, instead of Active Record. And it has a very lightweight, uh, everything that we've done is very, very, very small. The, the challenge I set forth for the team was the whole framework plus the user's app has to fit within three minutes, which in these devices and smartphones is sort of plenty small. And it actually exceeded that. I don't know if anybody read the Ars Technica article, but the editor, I was very impressed by this, he went and wrote his own Windows Mobile app. I saw you use Windows Mobile. He says, I know you guys are focusing on the iPhone. I wanted to do it on another device. So he wrote his own Windows Mobile app, and the executable size was 2.3 megs. So, uh, it works with sync local data. It exploits device capabilities, GPS, pin data, camera, SMS. And it's all available open source at github.com slash roamable. And when I say that it's available open source, like it's real time. So I don't know if any of you have ever like participated in our Google group or something or, or, or not, but um, because we have a bunch of our engineering in Russia, we're sort of like the sun never sleeps on the roamable development team. So the experience we've had so far is that people file stuff to the Google group and then there's a check-in like within 24 hours. Uh, and we get part of that because we're not doing the thing where we say, oh, we're open source and we drop a snapshot every six months. You know, it's, it's all real time. So what are the uh, role components? One is uh, Rose. It's a micro framework for building locally executing natively optimized mobile apps. Uh, develop, you run an app generator just like the rail scaffolding generator, very similar. Uh, for your objects of interest, and then you mostly edit HTML templates. So the developers that have used our stuff, it's certainly great that you can change the controller and, and write it in Ruby if you need to. And people will do one or two things, but generally uh, developers are spending most of their time just editing the HTML templates. And I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, it also happens to contain the first mobile Ruby implementation. And, and you know, in a, in a Ruby group, hopefully that's something that you guys are excited about, and, and I don't want to diminish that excitement, but people will sometimes say, oh, does that mean you're the mobile Ruby company? And they say, oh, I'm glad that you're excited about it. Well, not really. We actually are big fans of Ruby. We believe that eventually there'll be Rubies on all the devices, just shipping. And that's a very, very good thing. It will certainly decrease our development costs. Uh, and we're actually, uh, I'm speaking at Yuruko and in Barcelona uh, next month, and uh, and meeting with Mons at that, because he thinks it's cool that there's this mobile Ruby, and what we're going to try to do is get our mobile Rubies, like, you know, on his code path. And so, then it really won't be a mobile Ruby company, it'll be all about this framework, right? The ability to write native apps in HTML, and having this, like, sync client, and the device capabilities, and not so much the fact that created this Ruby implementation. Uh, you know, that said, the team has done an awesome job. We actually, they made it work really fast by doing some of the techniques done by Enterprise Rails where the right back caching with PCML was done. So we did that too. We had a huge difference in the execution speed on mobile. We've done quite a few tricks. So I'm really proud of the engineering team for what they've done, but still we'll probably get away from always uh, maintaining that implementation. So the, that's Rose, and that's what runs on the device. And then we have another piece called GrowSync. As we say, we're all about synced offline data, right? So we have to give you some way of doing that. And having the poor device talking to your back end is not a really good thing. It's not what you want to do. Uh, if it's talking to your back end with SOAP or REST, it's going to be very expensive. Uh, it's a lot of stuff for the device to manage. So the model of Rose is there's a Rosync client embedded in Rose, and what, what it does is it's sort of managing for you, getting all the data from the back end, bringing it to your device, taking any changes you do on the device, and sending it to the back end. So it's all transparent to you. So you as developers 
are always working with local data. You just use your ORM, it's a simple sort of subset of active, rec active record-like thing, and the data is always local, so you're never worrying about you know, dealing with the network or any of that stuff. And then the idea is that the Rosync client talks to the Rosync server very efficiently, basically through this optimized JSON format. Uh, so, this is the architecture that we're referring to. Uh, so, we provide everything that's there in red. Uh, Ruby, I love this car. Um, um, the Ruby interpreter, the ORM, uh, which we call ROM, the web server, and the Rosync client. Ah, so the question, why is there a web server? We're all about native local stuff. Why in God's name do we put a web server down here on this device? Okay, yes? Optimization. Well, so it turns out we do it because we're letting you write your views in HTML. Right? So we want to use, as you can see, the third party components are these gray things. We have a browser control there. So that's how we let you write your views in HTML. And we use the embedded browser control of whatever device it is to do the rendering, which solves like so many things for us of making it look good on all the devices. Um, things that's part of the magic of why it just works. You know, you write it once and you just do the build for the other device and it just works. Um, but that browser control expects to talk to a web server. So the, this web server we wrote is very small, and it's just sufficient to fool that browser control into thinking it's talking to a web server. Because again, it's all about working offline, you know, sync data locally offline. Uh, so who cares about our internals? It doesn't matter as much, right? But what are you writing? So you're writing everything that's there in gold. And so there's an app generator that generates a set of, for every object that you care about, say, uh, I don't know, you're doing a CRM app and you care about accounts and employees and uh, opportunities and contacts. So you'll run uh, the model generator for those things. And for each model, you'll get a controller and you'll get HTML templates. And again, you shouldn't need to modify the controller. It does what you, like, what, happens when you generate it from Rails Scaffolding. It's got basic create, create, read, update, delete operations. And for most of the stuff you need to do, you generally don't need to modify the controller, but you will probably end up modifying the HTML templates. We give you something basic, sort of like Rails Scaffolding, um, but you'll end up modifying that. Now, notice what we have here on the server. Now, you don't have to. Sometimes people say, well, do I have to do sync data? You don't have to. We certainly highly recommend it, and for most enterprise apps, you almost certainly want to do it. You almost certainly. We do have some consumer apps that are out there um, that I can give demos of later that they just don't need sync data. They do cool stuff with you know the device capabilities, and they don't need it. So you don't have to write that. But if you're doing like some interaction with some backend app, typically some enterprise app or some SaaS app, upper end service, um, you're going to want to write a source adapter. Uh, uh, we'll generate a source adapter, a skeleton, and that source adapter is basically six methods. Login, query, create, update, delete, and log on. That's it. So we generate the skeleton, you put some code in there, and typically you'll very often just be putting like a line of code in each one. At least for sugar CRM, it's very straightforward. If you're dealing with some nasty, gnarly backend that has some bad you know, interface exposed, you know, it'll be a few more lines, but it's very uh, approachable writing those source adapters. So we provide some sample apps. We have a sample app for Sugar CRM. We have a sample app for Siebel Field Service. Actually, we got some requests to extend it to all of Siebel CRM, and so we'll do that. Um, but more and more, it's about third-party apps. So there's a third-party app uh, for Basecamp, you know, the original Rails app, right? You know, DHHs. Wonderful app. So there's a uh, company called Carry the Day that had a product called Trail Guide. It was written for Windows Mobile, and they approached us because they wanted to port it to everything, but they didn't want to go. They were a small ISV. They did not have the resources to go and write an iPhone app and a BlackBerry app and an Android app and a Symbian app. So they rewrote it for us. Um, that product is called Trail Guide. Uh, there's a product called Mobile Lighthouse uh, from the VDG group. Um, we run our business off of it. You know, it's just a great, great capability. And they're going to uh, put other bug tracking, I, I think Lighthouse is the best bug tracking backend, but they're going to put other bug tracking backends like 
track and Jira behind that as well. Uh, there's a product, so Wikipedia, <coughs> Hampton Catherine of Hamel fame, great guy, um, saw her stuff on Ruby Inside, and he was most of the way through writing an iPhone app. Uh, the longer story is they thought he had an iPhone app, the original Wikipedia iPhone app. Um, Wikipedia bought his app from him and said, okay, these are all the changes we want you to make. So we rewrote it. We got 90% of the way to rewriting it in Objective-C for the iPhone. And he saw our stuff and he said to his bosses at Wikipedia, Wikimedia, this is a better way because uh, they wanted Android, they wanted other uh, OSs. And so he rewrote it in uh, rows. And uh, the interesting thing about that is, the reason I was telling you that you had written it once in the other way is he cut down his code base by 80%. So it was one-fifth the size of the code base once he did that. And we have this actually very detailed spreadsheet that shows like, you know, each class of thing, whether it's HTML or JavaScript or whatever, like just what he was able to save with rows. Um, there's another app called Pixelpedia. It's an evil consumer app thing where it's not written by Wikipedia uh, that you, know, you take a picture and then it says, okay, where are you located? And then it, sh it finds a map, right, using the GPS. And then it uh, looks up where you are on Wikipedia, because Wikipedia lets you give it GPS coordinates. So if you use Pixelpedia, and I took a picture here, to say, which I'm, I will do after this session, because it's so impressive here, um, it'll say, okay, you know, you, here's the map, and you are the Marconi Automotive Museum. I would assume, I would assume that would be up on Wikipedia. Um, so another exciting thing is uh, BMC. Who was asking me before that? Who's BMC? So I think they're the fourth or fifth largest software company in the world. So I'm somewhere, certainly in the top ten. A product called Remedy. It's in 10,000 companies. It's a, it's a uh, IT help desk thing, and they are uh, writing their next generation. They have a existing mobile product that's focused on the IT help desk professional. They're extending that to be something that all users can use. They're anticipating much greater sales of it, and they're writing that in rows now for a release in August. So, um, high-level overview, building roads app to get your data. Um, generally, it's better to start with row sync. That's what we do in our tutorial. If you're writing something that you don't care about sync data, then you can skip that step. But generally, it's a little easier to do it that way. Um, generate your app with row gen, it's a command line thing. Then develop your app in your Ruby HTML editor of choice. I love TextMate, so I'm assuming a lot of you guys do too. And then you build your app. So let's go ahead and do that. So here, terminal, and what I'm going to do is, at each step, I'm going to show you how you can sort of tell what Rogen can do. The first step, and I've already done this here, is you say gem install rows. So for a gem, it's up on Ruby boards like any other gem. Uh, and so once you do that, you get this utility called Rogen. So we're going to say Rogen. And we'll see the different options that we have. Is that big enough? Should I control plus it? A little bigger. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So you have three main things you can do. You can generate an app, a model, or a source. So typically, you're going to start, you're going to generate an app, and then you're going to generate a bunch of models. And uh, you can generate a source if you want to do the same. In the interest of time, this will be a half hour presentation, I'm just going to generate an app with one model. So I'm going to say rogen app, and then it will give us the usage for that. And it says, OK, um, actually, that one's pretty simple. It's just the name of the app. So um, I'm going to say rogen app, and I'm going to say LA Ruby contacts. It's a little contact matter. And where it does, it generates a bunch of files, just like you're used to. And I'll CD into that directory. And um, now I'm going to generate a model. And for a model, what it wants you to do is generate we'll the options. It wants you to give it a name, a Rogen model, contact. It wants a source URL. We're not going to do the same for right now. We can do it offline later. Um, so I'm just going to give it a blank source URL, a source ID, which can be anything. I'm going to give it an idea of one. And then we'll give it a set of uh, attributes. So we'll say name. Phone, city, state, zip. And uh, we'll go ahead and generate that. And now it generates all the stuff in the model. 
um, because it's you know, the same very similar set of stuff to General Grail, similar controller, similar set of. Uh, So here's our app, and there it is right there. And, and uh, we uh, we have here's in our, our uh, contact directory. We have like a controller. It seems very familiar. You shouldn't have to modify it right because it's your basic CRUD. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that all these get and post things they look really similar to Rails, but they're not quite identical to Rails. Anybody guess why? Brendan. So it turns out that if you want to make it work across all these browsers, some of them are a little bit funky in terms of supporting like put, delete, post in standard ways. So we made as close to the Rails REST conventions as we could, but it's not identical. Um, so this is another form that you'll typically end up editing. It's the uh, it's the uh, edit form. You know, you may edit, edit the new form. But the thing I wanted to show you is this HTML is very generic, right? It's just div tags and e tags. And some of you might say, well, geez, you know, aren't you doing any styling on this or anything from CSS? So here's what we do. We give you a generic, we generate generic stuff. And of course, you can style it however you want. You know, add your CSS locally in this file and add JavaScript. But what we do, though, is we have a styling library. Uh, and that styling library varies per device OS. So on iPhone, can you guess what we're using as our style library? We used IUI from Joe Hewitt, who's now on Facebook. But it's this great thing that makes your, so our iPhone apps look like native iPhone apps because of the work that, mostly the work that we did. We took it a little bit further than what we did, but when you get drop down lists, you get Apple scroll wheels. So it looks like a native app because of that IUI approach. And so we embed that. That shows up in your project tree. All the CSSs are there. You can change that, like just like we enhance go do and stuff. You can change that, and it'll just change. You don't have to like go check it into rows, right? It'll just be in your app tree that you're going to build from. So you can change it and enhance it. Uh, we don't consider ourselves really to be like CSS experts, so uh, you know. I'm sure you guys could potentially improve it. Although we've gotten feedback that the iPhone apps look really good. We've done the same thing on Windows Mobile and, and RIM on BlackBerry. Uh, and they look pretty good. I'd say that the iPhone UI is like maybe an A, because we spend a lot of time on it. The RIM and Windows Mobile are like B pluses, and full disclosure, the Symbian and Android are pretty plain vanilla. So you get all device capabilities, you get sync local data. I'm not ready to pretend that like our Symbian UI looks like a native Symbian app. It looks like mostly like a web app. But uh, we've actually had uh, we have developers that are interested in contributing to the Symbian style library, and I'm sure we'll do a better job than we do. Um, just developers in Europe tend to really know that stuff. And Android was just released uh, with our one out last week at March 24th at the Open Source Business Conference, and that's. It's pretty basic right now. It works, but it's pretty plain. So uh, let's go ahead, and I'm not going to change any of those now. Um, this is the top page of our app. This is the uh, index ERB that's right in the, in the root of the app. And we can add like, images and fonts and whatever we want to do. Probably do a lot of branding. Here I'm just going to do something very simple. I'm just going to have a link to my contact object. Now this is where, by the way, if we had multiple objects, we would have a whole bunch of links, right? Contacts, employees, opportunities, like all the things that we, we might care about, say, in our CRM app, or whatever app that we're working with. So we're going to say contacts. We can put whatever HTML we want here. Um, so I'll go ahead and do a save. And now I'm ready to do build. Um, so, uh, I love the fact that this is a Rails conference. Sometimes I've done presentations elsewhere. I'm showing this and they're like, what's great? So um, <laughs> we have this uh, rate-t list and we have, um, this is actually, with 1.0 you see all the OSs. Uh, I just have a little version on this. Um, so you see uh, build scripts for BlackBerry iPhone and Windows Mobile. The rate device block is just the build. But when you say rate run, it does a build and launches the emulator for that particular backend. That's sort of cool. So I'm going to do a rake 
run iPhone app. It does that nasty little process. Okay, here it is. This is our new app. Create a new contact. Create a new contact. And I'll go ahead and do create, and it shows up in the list. And so we get basic product <coughs> of those objects. We could continue and like do more generation of objects and change their top level stuff and we'll continue to get that that app built. Um, okay. So the status, um, we did a one hour release. Uh, this is actually my, my green presentation at the Open Source Business Conference last week, March 24th, uh, uh, at the Open Source earlier than that, but uh, at Open Source Business Conference. And the big, uh, we called it the 1.0 release, um, and we did that because it now supports uh, all shipping smartphone OSs once we added Android, uh, and it also has camera support. And we got, uh, I don't know if any of you saw, but we got a fair amount of press from like CNET, Ars Technica, Venture InfoWorld, uh, sort of surprised me how much uh, uh, reaction we got from that. So two other things that I wanted to tell you guys about. One is uh, Rohub. So uh, this is something we're about to release. And what it is, is it's hosted mobile app development, very similar to how many people have used Heroku here. Uh, so very similar to the idea of Heroku. Uh, so we are not doing this as a way to, we're not a cloud play. Um, we're just doing this as a way we can had users say, it would be great if I can use it even easier, right? Like maybe I don't want to install my own copy of Rosing. Uh, have an easy way to uh, expose the app. Uh, maybe I don't want to install the build environments for the different, even though we give you these great scripts, we expect you to have like the iPhone SDK installed or the Blackberry SDK, etc. So what we do is we provide hosted app development, hosted build, so you don't need to install all the different uh, development kits. And for some of them, like Symbian and Blackberry, if anybody's ever done that, it's pretty challenging to like get all that stuff installed. We make it easy with these write scripts, but you still have to get those installed. Hosted provisioning, so this is the idea that you will have like mobile, you know, m.mycompany.com, and the user hits that with their web browser, and then we figure out what version of the app you want, and we deliver that, you know, have a link to that download. Um, Hosted runtime, so we actually have a copy of Rosync. So you'll notice if you install Rosync that it's got a lot of features to be multi-tenant to allow like different people to hit it. You might say, why does that even matter? Like if I'm just installing my own copy of Rosync, it probably doesn't. But it was all so that it could be the back end for this Rohub thing. And uh, so the first hundred reg registrants, we we'll probably have to up that. We've got over 200. We want people to try it that are interested. Uh, so we'll. Expose it in waves. Starting, sorry. Two hundred one. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, we're exposing this private data. So feel free to register on robub.com. The other thing I wanted to tell you about that's not in the slides that we're doing an announcement press release tomorrow is um, there's this mobile app development contest that we first exposed like a month and a half ago. We really didn't promote it at all. And uh, so we're pushing back the deadline based on feedback from users. They want a little bit more time. 
We're pushing back the deadline to May 24th, and we'll judge it by the end of May. Uh, and so what this is, is uh, you write an app in Rose. If you're willing to open source your app, if you're not, that's fine. That, that means you end up like getting the, our commercial license, and that's, that's all good. But if you're willing to open source your app, then one of the things, because we're GPLv3, if you open source your app, you owe us nothing. That's one good thing. But if you're willing to open source your app, uh, then you can participate in the contest. And the best app um, that is created by May 24th, we have a $10,000 first prize, and we have a whole bunch of smartphones um, and related accessories for um, at least the next 10 best apps. So you have a reasonable chance of getting some cool swag out of it. Uh, a lot of really cool stuff out there. I don't know if anybody's seen. Uh, there's a guy named Makoto in London. A new, a new guy named Makoto. He's writing a mobile Twitter app with our stuff. And he's not just blogging about it, he established an entire blog. It's called rubyonmobile.wordpress.com. And it's far better than our tutorial. I mean, it's way longer than our tutorial because it's multiple blog posts. And I don't think we could have gotten away with that long. To prove. It's a great resource to learn about our stuff. And, uh, so his Twitter app is going to be good. You know, he's setting a high bar because he's like doing all this. My, I love Twitter. I use Twitter phone all the time. But he's using all the native device capabilities, which a lot of the other like mobile Twitters are not, because it's just hard, right? And with our stuff is just tags, and it's very easy. So that's an example of one one app out there. But it would be great. You're all, you know, accomplished for me developers. It would be great to have. Some of you guys enter the contest as well. So, uh, just to sum up, why Rotable? Um, we believe that the declarative tag based approach, i.e., web programming, should be a hard sell to Rails developers, right? It's just more productive than writing tons of Objective C code and Java code and C sharp code and, you know, Symbian C code. Uh, we think that a rich client against local data is much better than remote web apps. Uh, and uh, we allow you to write it once and it works on all smartphones. I know it seems hard to believe. We're always sort of amazed by it as well. But please give it a try and judge it for yourself. Uh, and it's open source from the ground up. So uh, do we have time for questions? Go ahead. Now remember, you can add whatever you want. 
right? Like, and we have instructions on the wiki about how to do that. So if there is some Ruby library that isn't there and you want to add it, you can do that. Uh, if you have to give back the money to Apple, do you have to still pay it 5%? Uh, no, 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 it's the net. So like, if you sell the app for 20 bucks and Apple gives you 14, right, then we only want 70 cents. So it's what, whatever you're getting. You have to refund the money back to the customer. Oh, uh, yeah, you know what? Uh, that's actually a good point. So we did recently modify our ISV agreement because we had an ISV that, that raised that very issue. So the new ISV agreement has that in it. Yeah. Uh, do you generate tests? Or like, how do you, how do I do TDD? So, um, yeah, that's actually a very good question. So in 1.0, uh, I have to say, you know, as a, as a, Rails developer, um, I'm spending more of my time actually programming in Rails because I'm maintaining Rosing than I am in Rose. I'm jealous of the people who get to spend all the time with Rose. And, but, but Rails has, you know, obviously a great testing environment and the ability to rate, like our spec test is wonderful. Um, we do not have that in 1.0 uh, in <coughs> Rose, you know, nothing close to that, but it's the theme of 1.1. So testing, is the theme of one one. So that means like we're gonna do the full compliance tests um, for our Ruby. You know, so sometimes people say, well what subset do you support? And the fact is we don't have great documentation of that. So we're gonna test our Ruby, we're gonna do performance testing, but we're also gonna provide developers with great testing framework for their apps. So that's a good question. Yes. Um, how do you guys get around uh, Apple's prohibition on scripting? Uh, so, with the application. So it, it turns out that rule 332 of the App Store says you can't download code over the internet to your interpreter. It's very clear that there's hundreds of apps that have interpreters available. The Telnet client you know, has a shell in it. Um, there are apps that like use the embedded JavaScript. Um, so Ruby is just one of the many interpreters that are out there. Um, so the bot the violation is that you download code and execute it on your Ruby interpreter. Now, so that said, we want to protect developers from being violated, like unknowingly, like accidentally, making some Ruby call and download it. So we've taken out eval. Um, you know, we have a framework, so the idea is you're sort of like working within the framework anyway, and you probably don't, won't need to do eval if you're sort of working within the framework. So to protect developers from inadvertently making that mistake and taking out the email. But um, we actually address that, like, question comes up often, and we address that in our fact like twice, where we say, you're, you're, you're compliant with rule 332 as long as you're not downloading code, and we'll try to make it very difficult for you to do that. Yes? So stuff like the camera code, uh, things like that, that uh, roads basically hand over yeah, we give you, we give you, not, so not only do we do camera capture, but we do camera capture sync to the back end. So there's features in Rhodes for like sending blobs back. So you can like take pictures and we'll make it very easy for you to get those pictures to your back end app. And this is based upon feedback from so developers. Is that, is that, uh, is that mechanism uh, available? Like let's just say if you wanted to be able to from within a Rhodes app uh, get access to something like an open GL canvas or something like that? Uh, yeah, so you can extend Rose to do additional things. We have a developer in Egypt, his name is Luda Bertel, and he is, uh, we get him the instructions that have is he is, he is doing a feature of overriding the incoming ringtone. Because we just said, you know, we'll eventually get to all device capabilities, that's like real low on the list. So we actually have instructions on how you can modify rows and add additional capabilities and like Shanuda signed a contribution agreement and you know we'll take his stuff back into the framework. So it'd be great if you wanted to add stuff and, and we'd love to have your contributions back to the framework. Okay, thanks very much.